Jeffrey, I read your book recently, The Twilight of Unionism. I was at the Historical Materialism Conference and I met you there and you gave a talk on how you see what's the future for unionism. How was your book received? It's out now. What? How long is it out now? It's uh, out now about a, about a year, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was sort of quite interesting. I mean, it was um, reviewed in the Sunday Times, which is quite surprised me quite a lot you know uh i must say and it was also reviewed in the financial times and i think that in itself was sort of quite sort of interesting because it i think it sort of struck struck a chord in certain sort of quarters you know and i mean obviously the neither the financial times or the sunday times was particularly left wing or or anything like that but and it was obviously raising sort of issues which they had some sort of sympathy with, which that, you know, well, Britain doesn't have any uh, any real sort of interest in this bloody place anymore, you know, Northern Ireland anymore. So I mean maybe maybe we actually should sort of think of sort of getting out. And I think and I think that was the sort of the general uh, the general feeling that, that 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 was being put forward in certain sections of the um uh, working of the ruling class, if you like, you know, which 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 is which is you know historically speaking quite sort of new, really. So I think that was that was quite sort of interesting, you know. It seems to be like a, a kind of a heady departure from like my days growing up, where you know the whoever was like the Northern Irish minister in the UK government was quite a prestigious role. To now, it's nearly like a a death sentence for a political appointee. Yeah, I mean, I remember, for instance, I, 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 I made this film for Channel Four about twenty years ago now, and and uh, part of that, I interviewed James James Pryor, who was the Secretary of State under Sir Thatcher, Northern Ireland Secretary of State, and Pryor, of course, was uh, didn't really like Thatcher, and Pryor said to me, "Well, I've been sent here, exiled, exiled here. I've been exiled." This is this is where they send people they want shot off, you know. And, <laughs> and I mean, to an extent, I mean that was right, you know. But I mean, actually, Pryor was a very interesting figure because he actually loved Northern Ireland because in Northern Ireland, he said, he said, what, he said what I love about Northern Ireland, he says, is 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 that the whole country is obsessed with uh, politics, you know, <laughs> unlike 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 Britain, you know, and and you know it was. Um, I mean, which is which is why he sort of loved being sort of Secretary of State. I mean, he was one of the more sort of liberal uh, Secretary of State uh, the, uh, the, of Northern Ireland has actually had. But it's interesting, you know, that that this uh, this sort of feeling that sort of Northern Ireland was a was a was a place where the sort of uh, the unruly princes, so to speak, are sort of sent to, you know, to sort of look after the crown, you know, sort of sort them out. I think that's that uh, that has always been to an extent, you know. The case from uh, medieval times onwards, really, you know. Oh, maybe I'm wrong, but like I would have thought when I was a kid looking at it that like somebody like you know Patrick Mayhew or someone like that would have been of a, a completely different stature of a politician compared to say I can't remember the name. There was a, a, a Tory minister recently who was surprised to know that people even voted on ethnic yeah. lines. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, not that, that, that poses lots of questions. I mean, it poses the questions about the the way Northern, the way both, both Northern Ireland and sort of Britain is sort of governed now by people who don't, basically don't know don't know what they're talking about. You know, I mean, whether this decline is restricted to Northern Ireland, but I mean, uh, or Britain as a whole, you know, as a as a as a big question. I mean, at the same time, we had we had we had people like. Roy Mason, who was a Northern Ireland Secretary of State under Callaghan, you know, who basically went there to try and get a military solution. And many of the um, of the crimes which were committed by British forces took place under his regime. You know, so, I mean, I mean, and I mean, he was again, he was he was an oddball, you know. But 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 I mean, that, that's. It's uh, very sort of interesting the way the way these these people, some of them, come to regard Northern Ireland as a place where they will sort of prove their prove their worth, if you like. While others, it's just somewhere well, you know, 
where they will go before they're 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 appointed sort of higher up. You know, I mean that. Um, if you take sort of an example of the Labour Party and the Peter Kyle, because the Northern Ireland Secretary of State isn't actually in the shadow cabinet, so he became Northern Ireland Secretary and then he's been promoted to something which is in the shadow cabinet. You know, so again, it's it's, it's sort of somewhere where you go to sort of you know serve your time if you like as well. I mean, it's it's it, which again is a reflection of the you know, lack of interest, which the whole Northern Irish question attracts from British politicians and indeed British left, it must be said, you know, too, you know, it is, it is a subject which isn't sort of talked about a great deal or certainly not as, not as extensively, which I, I obviously think it sort of should be, you know. I mean, it's, that's, this is the problem about writing writing books. I mean, publishers would say to you, oh, yeah, very good, but nobody writes books books about Ireland, you know, <laughs> which isn't exactly true, but it, it's, 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 again, part of the sort of the problems of, of, of trying to break the sort of silence or to, if you like, challenge misconceptions about Ireland, you know. And as I say, this also spreads to the sort of the left as well. It's just not, it's just not true. The ruling, the ruling class, which sort of doesn't doesn't uh, want to sort of talk about Ireland and sort of Britain, it's many layers of society which which sort of don't uh, want to, you know. And I've been sort of active in Northern Ireland politics and sort of Britain since since the nineteen seventies, really, and it's uh, it's often a hard grind, you know. I can imagine. So I suppose for you know some of our more international listeners, most of them aren't actually Irish or English, most of them are probably Yanks and all over the place, who mightn't have that much knowledge of the historical origins of unionism. I was wondering if you could give us like a, you know, a very quick overview of, you know, whatever, however long you want to do it, whether it's a thousand years or 200 years of of Irish history and unionism. Yeah, well, I mean, the... The union itself, of course, was was came into operation in 1801. But, of course, Ireland had been a colony of sort of England a long time before that and had its own devolved parliament in the 18th century, although it was only, it was only uh, Protestants who were allowed to sort of sit there. So it was, it was, it, it was if you like, the landed class or the professional class who sat in the, the devolved parliament up until the 1798 rising, which sought to secure uh, total independence for Ireland. And the 1798 rising was sort of interesting sort of in itself that it was organised by the United Irishmen. And the organising committee of that were composed of, it was 28 people on it, and, and, and 26 of them were, were Presbyterians, and two were members of the Church of Ireland Church. So they were all, they were all Protestants, you know? And, you know, I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole basis of, the, of this, of the sort of 1798 rising was an attempt both to secure an independent Ireland, but also to build a different type of Ireland in which in which in which Protestants and Catholics worked to uh, together, right, and, and and sort of challenge the, the various sort of property property classes and the and the whole land issues and the churches issues about discrimination and and sort of all this. And so it was a, it was a very very radical ideal, and because it took place in the wake of the French Revolution, and indeed was partly inspired by the French Revolution. The Act of Union was passed by the British ruling class in an attempt, because they were sort of worried about a, a devolved Irish parliament having links with any sort of radical, r- radical French government and using Ireland as a sort of stepping stone to an invasion of Britain. And, 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 and so the whole aspect of the union and the abolition of the devolved parliament, if you like, was to an extent uh, inspired by the whole security c- concerns of of the British state at the time, uh, and and obviously there were there were there were other reasons on top of that. I mean, the fact that 
most of the Irish land was sort of owned by either Protestants living within within the 32 counties of Ireland or indeed by absentee landlords living in Britain. And then again, the, the, the constant agitation for peasants' rights, tenants' rights, and so on and so on was a, was a sort of secondary factor where they hoped that the Act of Union by integrating the rest of Ireland within uh, Britain would, 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 if you like, make it more like Britain. But basically, the Act of Union never actually did that in the sort of first place. And it was still regarded more or less as a sort of in a colonial mode for, you know, for the next hundred years, if you like. And, and, and that was, the sort of union made things much more problematic in the end for the British state and its c c control of Ireland. So to an extent, the, 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 the agitation of the sort of 19th century also meant and the economic and social conditions of Ireland also meant that Ireland was, was, was I think, the only place in Europe to suffer a decline in population in the 19th century. And obviously there was issues like the sort of famine and so on and so on. So throughout the 19th century, the agitation grew and the questions of the existence of the union remained to the fore, as well as the various social and economic conditions. And of course, this was to, uh, this was to come to fore at the, at the start of the 20th century. So that's uh, that's the sort of nineteenth century dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> and where, what, how, what was the role, say, of like, say, kind of a reactionary uh, Protestant politics in this time and the emergence of the Orange Order? Yeah, well, I mean, the Orange Order were sort of quite interesting because the Act of Union they were divided over it because some of them, you see, because the Act of Union originally was meant to also give what was called uh, Catholic emancipation uh, is gives sort of voting rights and so on and so on to Catholics. And that then that didn't actually happen for another 30 years. But the Orange Order uh, were worried about that and worried about the active union would actually give Catholics more rights. As I say, it sort of didn't in the end. But as a result of this, the Orange Order was actually split on whether the active union was a good or a bad thing, or whether it would be best to keep up with a sort of Protestant parliament in the 32 counties of Ireland and maintain quote, control by the, by the sort of local sort of Protestant upper class, if you like. But anyway, that, that, that feeling lessened over the, over the years. But the, the aim, the basic aim of keeping some sort of authority and control and ownership by this Protestant sort of elite, which obviously came from the uh, the plantation of Sir Ulster in the 17th century and making these settlers stay in control. The aim had always been, well, what, what, is, the, what is the political formation which best suits that, and whether it was a devolved parliament with the Protestants in charge, or whether it was a British parliament with the British in the charge, was, if you like, a debate which, which, which did take place within the pro-unionist Protestant settler population throughout the 19th century. And during that time, both, both the sort of unionists in Britain which was essentially mainly the Conservative Party and those in uh, Ireland, which was mainly in the north of Ireland, because that's where the Protestants mainly were, came to debate which solution was the best way forward for them. But the whole philosophy, if you like, behind this fitted in with basically the same sort of colonialist ascendancy sort of views. I mean, if you like to, 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 to be sort of crude about it, that as far as Britain and Ireland was con concerned, the English were a superior race and a superior culture with superior ideas to the Irish. 
and within Ireland, the Protestants had a superior culture to the sort of Catholic masses. And if you look at the sort of writings of, of, of some of the sort of unionist leaders in uh, Britain and the speeches and and, uh, and so on, people like Randolph Churchill and Joseph Chamberlain and sort of pe people like that, you will see them time and time again referring to how superior both the Protestants were in their sort of culture and in their politics and their way of organising their society and, of course, how superior the English were. And, you know, the whole traditional way and explanation that people who colonise other countries always put put forward that they were on a civilizing mission so to speak against and i mean that those sort of arguments which uh, which we which we know well about and have applied to many other countries and many other ruling states uh, were also applied to sort of uh, ireland at that stage in the 19th uh, century so can we talk then about how the emergence of like the northern irish state occurred then yeah well i mean the again if you look at the some of the the debates around Irish home rule in the 1880s, you will find that the Northern Ireland Unionists, the, Northern, the North of Ireland based Unionists, did not want a parliament in Northern Ireland. Indeed, they specifically said it was, uh, it was a wrong idea, even it was sort of treasonous and so on and so on. Because, you see, from their point of view, if there was a parliament in Northern Ireland again, it might weaken the whole idea of the union. So they were never actually in favour of establishing a Northern Ireland parliament for many, many years. In fact, even up to the establishment of the parliament itself in 1921, which was denounced by the unionist leader, Edward Carson. So they were never actually in favour of that because, as I say, they thought that it, it actually weakened the idea of the union. But obviously the the events in the rest of Ireland and the, the 19, which were kicked off, if you like, by the 1916 rising, and by the War of Independence from 1918 to, uh, or 1919 to 21, persuaded the British that some sort of home rules, self-rule, had to be given to Ireland or the sort of situation would only get worse. So the idea was debated on what sort of solution would be best. And again, obviously, the sort of British state was looking at this from a British state point of view rather than what was best for, for the people of the 30, 32 counties. So the solution which came forward and discussions between some of the unionist leaders in the north of Ireland and the British government at the time headed by Lloyd George was to have the partition of Ireland and the northern state was so established. I mean, that state was six counties, but I mean, again, the sort of records show that this was this this wasn't a state which reflected any natural borders. It wasn't a state which reflected any settled community, if you like, because just under a third were sort of Catholics. Uh, so it, it it was a totally unnatural state which was created and that to an extent was to be a problem right it was established in 1921 that was to be a state which was established in 1921 and that was to be a problem this unnatural nature of the state which existed for the next hundred years and indeed still still does because to create a state which hasn't a economic or physical or geographical or community rationale is bound in the end to 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 have problems within it, and that you know those those problems came to the surface in sort of 1968, and have been and have been with us ever since, really. You know, of the original nine counties of Ulster, only six were brought into the new state in order to give a large. Protestant majority that if the entire Ulster would have been close to 
50 50. Now, some of those counties, like particularly like Fermanagh and, and Tyrone, I think they would have been, even some of the counties contained would have been, I think at the time would have been majority Catholic. Would I be correct in saying that? That's right. Yes, 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 yes. They were, I mean, most of the West. And again, it, 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 it was. I mean, it was always sort of worked out to say, well, how many, how many, I mean, it was worked out by the British state and by the sort of unionist leaders, if you like, led at this time also by sort of James, James Craig. And it was, it, it was a question of how much land they could grab without being threatened by being eventually outnumbered by Catholics. And, and they had a, they had a sort of opportunity, and this is a, this is one of the points I sort of raise in the in the book. They they had this opportunity in sort of nineteen twenty one to say, right, we are we are now going to create this new Northern Ireland state, but we're going to try and win the Catholics over within this boundaries of the six of the six county state, which they never attempted to actually do. I mean, they always saw the Catholics, the Catholic masses, the, who were obviously pro-nationalist and opposed to partition. And they saw them as the enemy, if you like, throughout the existence of the state, the enemy within, and, and sort of treated them that way, which, which is one of the, the explanations for the discrimination, the repression, and so on and so on, which Northern Ireland became became famous for, you know. So yes, but again, if you sort of look at the thinking when the Northern Ireland state was actually created, there was a sort of rationale about that. That I mean, how many can we let in without, how much land can we grab without putting ourselves at, at, at sort of risk by being outnumbered? And that's, that's, that's why the six, the six counties were actually chosen from that. Is there any kind of rationale there as well as like that they could be used as some kind of nearly like a buffer zone between the two states? I mean, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, the, the other thing to sort of bear in mind was that when the original partition agreement was actually signed, this was, this was subject to a possible redrawing of the border and a border commission was established by Britain, and it was a wide expectation at the time that some of the west of Northern Ireland would actually be absorbed within the sort of southern state, Fermanagh especially, and that this didn't actually happen sort of in the end. Again, was something which caused great resentment because both in, the, in sort of all of Ireland, if you like, because people felt they had they had been misled by Britain when they signed the treaty, because they were told, you know, it's all right, you will get you will get one and a half more sort of counties back, and this will make Northern Ireland not a really sustainable sort of entity, and then you know it will be eventually absorbed into the twenty six county state. I mean, those that those sort of promises were actually made, and if you read some of the the views of some of the sort of leaders at the time, Winston, Winston Churchill's history, for instance, you will you will find that there there were elements within the within the British state who thought that that would that would sort of happen. But again, the whole security question came to the fore because because I mean, again, there was always this worry throughout that with the establishment of a sort of independent southern state although for the first 20 years it was sort of semi semi sort of independent that that state could could sort of make make sort of alliances with the uh with the enemies or the opponents of these or british states so i mean not with this this security angle which was as i've said was there at the sort of start of the union was always there until until very um very recently really yeah, it's interesting because uh, I didn't know in uh, reading in your book, there was a fact that Carson and his Ulster volunteer force, that they got a big shipment of guns in from the Germans. That was, I think, in 1914, which would have been a pretty, you know, contentious issue for the British state. Mm. 
but uh, yeah. as well, the, the 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 Republicans got guns in as well that landed, I think, in Holt is at 1916 for the 1916 rising. So we had like German imperialism playing both sides of the Irish conflict. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, there was even there was even in one Orange March, there was a Orange March and one of the banners of this Orange March had a, had a sort of uh, picture or a drawing or a depiction of the German Kaiser. You know, it was amazing, really. You know, so again, the, I mean, anything, I mean, anything, of course, the German Kaiser was sort of Protestant, you know, anything, <laughs> anything better than, than being ruled by these deficient Irish or Catholics, if you like, you know, and I mean, I mean, this was the, the this was the thing, I mean, it was, I mean, it just wasn't a, a sort of any question of identifying with Britain. It was a question of how the moneyed classes in sort of Northern Ireland would resist the encroachment of what they saw as the uncultural Irish Catholic masters who believed in dangerous things like one person, one vote and all this, you know. It 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 it, it was always throughout and they had this economic and social and cultural dimensions to it, which of unionism as today is 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 question how do we how do we keep in power? How do we keep in control? How do we find defend our sort of interests and how do we promote our own culture? I mean, you know, it's, 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 these are the questions which have bedeviled unionism, if you like, for, for a long time now, you know, and, 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 and to an extent still certainly sort of haven't been solved in the last 20, 30, 40 years, you know. So how did the polit the politics within the unionist community evolve then over the history of the state? Well, over the over the history of the state, I mean, it 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 is remarkable that the Unionist Party, which came into power in nineteen twenty one and was part of at that time, it was part of the Tory Party, which of course was the Conservative and Unionist Party, and the Northern Ireland Unionist Party was, if you like, Northern Ireland wing of that party, and I mean that that isn't something which isn't sort of recognised a great deal. And this actually only, only, they only broke away from the Tories in the 1970s. So there was this wing of the British Conservative Party, although they, they, they did have their own, right, you know, their own sort of party within that. And this party evolved a strategy which said the best way to hold on to their, I mean, it was an all-class party, and although it was led, for, certainly for the most part, by uh, members of the uh, moneyed, moneyed classes, if you like, or the landed classes within Northern Ireland, and they evolved a strategy that the best way to hold on to the support of their working class, the Protestant working class, was to build a system in which that working class was given privileges over the Catholic working class. And, and, and that was, again, the root of the discrimination and the fact that Protestants, and, and this just, that, that, that sort of Protestants, both in the public and indeed in the private sector, had first shout for jobs and the better jobs and the more skilled jobs, and that to keep the Catholics in their place, if you like, there was this vast, well, relatively speaking, vast security establishment which was built up, which comprised both the police and the, the B specials, who were both more, uh, certainly the B specials were exclusively Protestant and the police were sort of 90, 95% Protestant. And so you had this, well, what Michael Farrell called in his, in his book, uh, The Orange State. And the state was, as I say, built up to ensure that a sort of that the sort of Protestant working class identified with this uh, Northern Ireland state because they got they they were one ring up the ladder from from the sort of Catholic masses. And again, it's the whole argument which is which is seen in other countries and in other 
societies that the sort of poor poor whites if you like feel themselves one step up the ladder from the black black people so the northern Ireland protestants were rewarded and felt that they were one step up from the sort of catholic masses and, and this was an incredibly successful political strategy i mean if you take just before the outbreak of the troubles the ulster unionist party were receiving between 65 and 70 percent of the votes in northern ireland and and although there were various splinter parties who had, at, at the time tried to raise social and sort of economic issues they they never survived or they never had any mass support it was always this idea of the all-class alliance if you like of the protestantism unionism came first and all other questions social questions economic questions culture questions came sort of second and, and and that sort of political culture survived and in many ways still actually does survive among among many in the sort of protestant masses if you like the troubles kind of blew apart this conservative rule led to a big change in the political scene that's right that's right i mean i mean the troubles the, the troubles broke out basically into 19, 1968 with the sort of civil rights movement and the sort of civil rights movement was an attempt to challenge the sectarianism which 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 i've sort of talked about the discrimination and sort of so on and so on and and and, and that i mean it, certainly at the start it was never intended to challenge the existence of the northern ireland state itself but merely to try and reform Northern Ireland. And to an extent, the attempt to reform Northern Ireland has been going on ever since, if you like. And, and, and it was the, the Unionist Party and then the British state's handling of the civil rights movement, which in the end only made things matters worse, because uh, made uh, matters worse. Because obviously, and this was highlighted by by things like when the British state became directly involved through the arrival of British troops, when the British troops came in, and they imposed, in, when, when the civil rights movement spread to the ghettos and the masses and so on and so on, and so barricades were sort of set up. And these barricades and things were, were set up because quite sort of rightly Catholics in places like Belfast were concerned about Protestant loyalist mobs coming into their area and sort of burning them down, which has indeed sort of happened. And so the barricades were sort of set up and British troops came in and the British troops' job was to break down these barricades, if you like. So they became much more identified with the sort of uh, unionist Protestant community. And um, they became, if you like, part of the problem from the sort of Catholic sort of point of view. And it was the role of the British troops in the early early 70s, which was obviously illustrated by things like Bloody Sunday, which to an extent persuaded many people that the whole idea of reforming Northern Ireland was a, was a non-starter and put on the agenda the very existence of the Northern Ireland state itself and British involvement within that state because obvious, obviously the British state had allowed Northern Ireland to discriminate you know for sort of 50 years and hadn't sort of interfered and said no you can't even talk about this in a sort of house of uh, commons and so on like this all of these things which sort have of happened and so once the the sort of the Northern Ireland government the unionist Northern Ireland government could no longer control or defeat the civil rights movement, which was then attracting support of the sort of civil rights movement. The only thing they could do was sort of bring in the more direct involvement of the British state, which sort of highlighted the sort of role of that state. And as I say, it was then became not simply a civil rights question, but a sort of national question and a question of the existence of the sort of Northern Ireland state and the a question of the existence of British presence within that state. You, you detail quite a lot of very interesting stuff in the book. 
particularly like around, I found very interesting was the introduction of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Do you want to explain a little bit to people what that was and what how that interacted with the politics up north? Yeah, well, the, the, the I mean, the sort, of, the sort of British sort of attitude was that, you know, the publicity which the civil rights movement drew and the sort of sympathy which the civil rights movement attracted not just in Ireland itself, but in Britain and throughout the world, if you like, is that something had to be done about Northern Ireland. And you couldn't you couldn't sort of allow the sort of situation where this Unionist Party had unfettered sort of rule, if you like, and that Catholics were permanently excluded both from jobs and the security services and from government that this sort of situation had to change. And, um, you know, for the, I mean, the, the sort of British were much more um, rational about these things, if you like, than the Unionists within Northern Ireland. And so things like when, first of all, the British abolished the Northern Ireland Parliament and uh, instituted direct rule. But the problem which that produced was that this direct rule meant that Britain was now identified by many Catholics as the enemy rather than simply the Northern Ireland government. So the sort of direct rule experiment was not one which Britain really thought would secure any long-term settlement or peace. And various solutions, power sharing, was put forward. And the Anglo-Irish agreement was sort of one of those which was agreed over the heads, over the head of the Northern Ireland Unionism and the Northern Ireland Protestants. And it was opposed by, oh, basically, you know, 90% of Protestants within Northern Ireland, and that included the churches. I mean, even the Northern Ireland churches came out against it, and, and uh, Protestant churches, because they thought it was challenging the right of the Northern Ireland Unionists to sort of rule themselves, and it was a dictate by the British government. So um, that, that, to an extent, was produced a questioning within unionism itself of the role of the British state uh, and whether they could be trusted. And I mean, for the next, if you like, 40 years up until the, up into and including the Good Friday agreement, all these attempts by the British state to try and reform Northern Ireland or to introduce power uh, sharing and things like that produced great calls of sellout by the unionist population aimed at the uh, British government. So this 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 produced a sort of, sort of added tension, if you like. And an added thing is that the that the sort of British sort of couldn't be couldn't be trusted with sort of Northern Ireland. And indeed, as I say, that feeling exists in a very wide, widespread way, even sort of, well, more so probably today than it, than it actually ever, ever sort of has done because of the whole Brexit thing, you know, and so on and things like that, that, um, that the British can't be trusted. So, so I mean, that, that, that to an extent began with the Anglo Arch, well, began with the abolition of the own Northern Ireland Parliament and then an attempt to sort of reform this by the Anglo Arch Agreement and various other uh, things which were res which, which change and reform and equality legislation was always re resisted by the Protestant community uh, as a whole, really. Apart from, if you like, about 10 or 15 percent of them who were who were who 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 were part of the whole liberal tradition within sort of Protestantism, but I mean the majority of sort of Protestants opposed this, and this was all very well. But the problem for them was that what you replace it by, if you don't trust an All Ireland, and if you don't trust the sort of British state. And if the British state won't allow the Protestants to rule Northern Ireland as they want, then what is your solution? And unionism has never really come up with what their solution would actually be to this, what way forward. And, and as I say, those debates continue today within sort of unionism. And, and you know, the most recent, recent example, if you like, of this is the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, today recently said that we can't have direct rule because we, we, 
we cannot trust Britain to run Northern Ireland. And 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 this then, as I say, raises the question, well, what are you going to do? What do you want? Because what has now happened, of course, is that the sort of Catholics with the Ireland are now on an equal par with them in terms of population wise and indeed are their major the sort of major party in Northern Ireland is now Sinn Fein, the traditional the traditional sort of Republican enemy. So again unionism, right? So you can't trust Britain. We can't have home rule because this will be sort of Sinn Fein run. And we don't want an all Ireland because this will be run by, you know, seventy uh, percent of them will be sort of Catholic. So where do they go? This is the sort of problem they have created for themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, perhaps if they tried to build a nice normal Northern Ireland state from nineteen twenty one sort of onwards, in which they thought to encourage Catholics to play a part in that state. Maybe these things wouldn't have wouldn't have sort of happened, but it is now rather late in the day to try and change that, you know. And I mean, even now, as I say, there are strong elements within sort of unionism who say, you know, the, the whole question that that the whole idea of having a first minister, a member of Sinn Fein, is 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 so horrible to them. Right, then 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 they just won't accept this. So where do they go from here? And the sort of question and sort of and to my view is that is that they sort of slowly uh, fade away, if you like. That as a as a book title is we are now seeing the twilight of sort of, of unionism because unionism hasn't got a rational, sensible way forward anymore, you know.